This program does not represent the views of this station and may be considered offensive to some listeners. This program may contain mature subject matter, including frank discussions of controversial topics. It is intended for mature, open-minded audiences. Discretion is highly advised. This program is entirely independently produced by and is copyrighted by Frank. It is broadcast here under license. The opinions and comments expressed are those of the host and participants and not necessarily the opinion of CINQ-FM 102.3. This is Know Your Rights on CINQ-FM 102.3, cable 88.3, www.radiocentreville.com. This is a legal show, and my name is Ted Wright. I'm your host and... Karen Marshall, paralegal and co-host. And we have today, Franco, we're going to be doing a small series with three different people about copyright and how it affects uh, whatever we see and hear and do. And now, Franco, uh, he has done a master's degree in this area, and he will define it more closely. And he also works for a major animation company, which shall remain anonymous. So, Franco, thanks for being here, and what are you all about? Hi, Ted. It's great to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, my master's thesis was on character culture. Now, what exactly is character culture? You have the creators who create the characters that become very popular. You mean like Bugs Bunny, Steamboat Willie, which exactly. is Mickey Mouse? And then you have the audience users, people who watch television, watch film, maybe listen to radio. That means like us. That's right. And we end up having some sort of a connection with those characters, and we end up using those characters in other ways that the authors, the creators, didn't intend. So in other words, I see Mickey Mouse, and I might, or I might, I see Popeye, and I might say, I'm Teddy the Sailor Man. So in other words, I use it in a way they didn't want. Or you've got Betty Boop, oop, boop, boop, boop. I'm picking those two because they are, they've been around for like 60 or 70 years. That's right. So they're into our culture with some people. And then the issue becomes, can you own a character? Is it a form of property that should belong strictly to the authors? And should the authors have the right to say yes or no to the different ways that the audience, that's us, want to use it? In some cases, sure, there's certain things that maybe we shouldn't allow. But in most cases, if you're the type of person that you're at home and you want to take a, an image of, let's say, Popeye or Betty Boop and put that on a T-shirt... What are the issues involved there? Now, I, I just want to let everybody know here, in 1995, which is uh, seven, eight years ago, Franco actually created a television program about puppets. So he's sort of talking about what he knows about. So continue. Uh, should I continue on with sure. the Sure, yes. Okay, well, in 1995, I produced a program called The Paradites. It was loosely influenced by The Muppet Show, which was a Jim Henson project. I'm a very big fan of Jim Henson's. And over the course of about a year and a half, we made 15 episodes. The quality wasn't that great, but the imagination and the work that went into it was phenomenal. And you still have copies? Yes, I do. I have the masters. Great. What ended up happening is when the time came for me to leave the station, the questions came up. Who owns this program? If somebody created a character and somebody else wrote a script and somebody else wrote a song for that script based on that character and it was based on another person's concept and you had another person who was performing the character, who owned what rights in this production? So can you tell us where it goes from here? Because I never thought of it that way. Basically, if you have the opportunity to do this type of a project or your own film or your own television program, it's best to take care of these details on paper before you start shooting. That was the mistake I made back in 1995. There was nothing written down. I wasn't even thinking about copyright at that time. It was more of just getting on with this great adventure of creation. But if you have the masters, doesn't that infer you have greater ownership? Not necessarily. Oh, boy. See, p most people think that possession is nine-tenths of the law. And that is true for most areas of property, except for copyright, which is an intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Just because you're in possession of it doesn't mean you own the copyright. The same way that if you go out and you buy a book or maybe a painting that's been uh, reprinted many times, when you go out and buy a CD, you own the physical CD, you own the physical book but you do not own the copyright in those items. Mm -hmm. So where did your thesis take you? Just well, where after, does it go? Pick something because you're talking about stuff we don't know much about. 
All right, well, after the whole experience and I came to terms with the various creators there, I decided that there were certain things I wanted to learn. I don't ever want to be in a position where something that I have invested so much time in could be taken away from me. Mm -hmm. So I continued on with my education, which led me to a master's degree, which I did at the McGill University Graduate Program in Communications. Mm -hmm. And I got to focus on character culture, which allowed me to focus on character creation and the law as a subcontext. And okay. I got, it allowed me to figure out how to protect myself and how not to get sued in the creation of characters within any medium or any work. Now, before we go any further, is there any, do you want to define something about the law that is pertinent here? Absolutely. The first thing I want to say to any creator out there who's thinking about creating or writing a television show, a film, or taking a picture, the laws in the United States are very different than the laws in Canada. Which means that when you watch a program like The Simpsons, which many creators are inspired by, you have to understand that a show like The Simpsons is created in the United States by an American producer. They are under different laws than those here in Canada. If you've ever wondered why Canadian comedy is different from American comedy, it's because we do not have the same allowances for parody. And The Simpsons is a classic example. One of the funniest shows around. I believe that uh, with the renewals of the series, they've now, they've now reached the record for the number of episodes for a sitcom. Yeah, I think they're in 12. This is the 13th season or 12th season. Yeah, they've mm -hmm. outlasted Ozzy and Harriet. Oh, really? I forgot even it existed. Well, that held the record previously. The Simpsons are now taking over. And The Simpsons rely very heavily on the item of parody. And the United States, or producers in the United States, can do that under their law. Here in Canada, we're much more restricted. What, what can't we do here that they can do in the States? Can you give an example? Any parody that we do here in Canada requires the permission of the original owners that, of the works that we're trying to do the parody of. In other words, if they quote from a movie... Well, okay, quoting is one thing. I'm talking about really making a satirical... Uh, production. He, let, let me give you an example. Okay. A show like Saturday Night Live right. will take well-known characters, let's say superhero characters, mm -hmm. and present sketches based on those well-known characters that they don't own. Parody in the United States falls under things like freedom of speech and falls under fair use. Fair use is when you're allowed to use a copyrighted work, but to a limited extent. Right. And you don't have to ask for permission. Yeah. In Canada... Parody is not at all seen as a freedom of speech, fair use, or a criticism. Here in Canada, it's seen as a derivative work. It's gone beyond the point of influence. Sorry, so what would happen like something like with Aislinn? I'm not familiar with that. Aislinn, the... the um... he, he's a caricaturist in the Gazette. He does political cartoons. That falls under news reporting, and my feeling on that, although I have not researched that particularly, so this is strictly the opinion of an academic. Okay. My feeling of that is, A, if it's going under the area of news reporting, and it's used in a very limited frame. I mean, I, I believe he only gets a one frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he only gets the one. And it's more of a commentary. Um, that's, that might fall under fair dealing here in Canada. If he was using the same character on a daily basis, mm -hmm. day after day after day, well, we've crossed the line. Now the original person that he is parodying may require some uh, compensation. Now, if I'm not, wait, I think I know this one. Isn't he the one who was talking about um, parodying a lot of government figures? Yes. Okay, well, this, see, we're not talking copyright here Okay, now. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to cut it here. We're going we're gonna to be right back. This is Know Your Rights on CINQ FM 102.3. My name is Ted Wright, your co-host along with Karen Marsh and Priscilla Duarte. You're listening to Franco, but he's talking about character creation and the law. And we'll be back in a minute. Frank Talks is sponsored in part by Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test, a man's guide to the emotional needs of women. Ladies, does your man squash your inner vixen? When you ask him to repeat what you have just said to him, does he look at you like a deer caught in the headlights? Does he think that leaving the game on while you talk to him is a good idea? Is his favorite phrase, yes, dear, you are absolutely right. Does wife or girlfriend mean boring and dull to him? Ladies, don't you wish that he knows what you mean when you ask him if you look fat? Then you need to buy him the book, Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test, A Man's Guide to the Emotional Needs of Women. On sale now at franktalks.com. 
This is Know Your Rights on CINQ 102.3 FM. My name is Ted Wright. I'm the coordinator of Westmount Legal Clinic. That's my legal stuff. And uh, we're talking with Franco, who has a master's, wrote a master's thesis on character creation and the law. And uh, Karen and yourself were talking during the break. Continue. Yeah, well, we were just talking about who goes after, like, like if somebody were to use your work, who who would go after... When it comes to copyright law, usually the onus is on the creator, meaning that if somebody uses your work, you're the one who's responsible for going after them, nobody else, unless you have a contract with a group or an individual who has promised to take your rights and defend them and make you money. Uh, a good example of that, if you're a writer who's written a book and you, mm -hmm. you sign your rights over to a publisher, at that point, it's the publisher's obligation, usually, pending whatever's in the contract, to go out and defend the property because they're going out, going to make money with it, and send you a portion of that money. Again, that would be the paperwork prior to... The paperwork prior to uh, this uh, sending out copies of your work. Okay. Okay, so, I mean, like, like we were talking, like, uh, with the paperwork... That you have to do, is there anything else you have to do prior to? You have a contract? Essentially, it's this. Whatever it is that you're about to create and go ahead in a creative endeavor, make sure that whoever you're creating with, you all understand exactly what you intend to do with this work. Uh, what am I you mean what you're going to do after the work is completed? That's right. I think maybe you might need a lawyer, a con contractual writer. There are actually a lot of books out on the market that you could pick up, depending on what your domain is. Mm -hmm. um, my, I have found that you don't necessarily need a lawyer, although it's a very good idea to speak mm -hmm. to one. It's a lot more of an understanding with your fellow creators. Uh, for example, uh, one of my clients was a music group. Mm -hmm. Now, these were three musicians who got together to do a project, quote-unquote, for fun. Okay. They were going to put together an album of about 10 songs for fun. Okay. It was with the understanding that, hey, we're just going to get together and jam and have a good time and make this music, and it was going to be great, it was going to be hot. And halfway through the album, they let somebody listen to it who wanted to produce the album. The music was that interesting, and this guy, who had actually some money in his bank account, decided, yeah, I'd like to produce you guys. And then the real questions came up. Well, wait a minute. We were doing this for fun. Now, you had two out of the three guys who wanted the record to be produced and released, and you had one guy who said, well, no, I only did this thing for fun. The three of them created the, mu part the music all together, which means that even if two say yes and one say no, the answer is an overall no, because you need everybody together or not at all. That's a Canadian uh, way of behaving, by the way. But then if they just went ahead and, and, and copied the album or copied the music without the copyright, uh, they it, wouldn't be entitled to anything. That's right. It would, it would be an infringement, and uh, any money that come in could actually go to the infringed party, depending on uh, how, how that turns out. And then it would be who owns the words and who owns the music. Look, the biggest problem with this particular group of clients that, that I was dealing with was that they had intended one particular way of behaving with this created work. Mm -hmm. And then along the way, two out of the three decided they wanted to do something else. But nobody wrote down anything. This was all a verbal agreement. So one of the guys said, boy, oh, wait boy. a minute. You know, one of the guys in the three, and I have to actually look at his side and say, yeah, he has a legitimate point. He never said he didn't want it to go anywhere. He just said they weren't actively going to pursue anything. But the fact that an opportunity came up, this one of the three wants to be a professional musician and looking for a record deal. The other one of the three just wanted to do it for fun. If they had taken the time to at least write down on paper what it is each expected, these type of details would have gotten cleared up. Either they would never have made the project at all, or they would have made the project with the understanding that if somebody comes by, they're going to behave in a certain way. The fact is, that producer backed out, and that project, half an album full of songs, is sitting on a shelf somewhere. You know, well, dust. Let me, I have to change direction here because we've got so much to talk about. Item number three in the paper you gave us, the difference between copywriting a character and being influenced as part of the creative process. It's written, copyright is automatic. Once the work is in a fixed, tangible form, copyright automatically exists. Thus, it protects the expression of an idea, but not the idea itself. Now, we've got a whole bunch of things, non-copyrighted idea, 
copyright protected expressions like aliens from outer space come to to live among us on earth well you know third rock from the sun mork and mindy my favorite martian alf where do we go with this okay the idea is this when you're trying to figure out whether or not you're crossing a line of infringement you have to understand that human beings do not operate within a vacuum they're going to be influenced by everything and everyone around them but there is a difference between being influenced and direct copying. You know you've crossed the line when what it is you create is so similar to another work that you were influenced by that the public would actually think it's the same work. Now, here another example. I'm a big Jim Henson fan. I love the Muppets. Kermit the Frog is my idol, and I hope someday to grow up to be just like Kermit the Frog. But when I created my puppet show, I did not do it so close to the Muppets that people would, would be confused between my show, The Paradites, and The Muppets. Although, people will say, hey, it's a puppet show, and people will usually think of The Muppets when they hear puppet show. But just watch the program, and you'll see that it's different. That's the line of influence. Let me ask a question. What happens if I'm on the radio and I go, Hi, Kermie, how are you doing? If I, and I use a voice derivative of The Muppets. Where does that fit in? Okay, now, if you're doing it to promote a product if you're doing it to promote your show, that might be considered, wait a minute, did he go to Jim Henson Company and get permission to do that? Because uh, being in a very capitalist society, as we are here in Canada the United States, most people might consider that. If you do it the one time, like you just did it now, in a context, mm -hmm. context, very important, in a context where, hey, you're just having a good old time and you, you just decide to talk like Kermit the Frog here, here <laughs> on the radio show, know your rights. Well, this is something where you can laugh at, have fun with. Yeah, that falls under, again, fair dealing. It's all in the context. If you're going to start opening your radio program every single week that way, well, we have a problem here. Mm-hmm. Because you're making people who are listening think that somehow the Jim you're Henson connected. Company endorses what you're doing. So in other words, you're stealing from them through a fake endorsement or a fake allusion to an endorsement. You're not just stealing, by the way, whatever money that they think uh, they're going to lose being associated with this program. You're also stealing the very thing that they did in creating a character, and that is the connection with the audience. People mm -hmm. now might be tuning in, if they're Kermit the Frog fans, might be tuning into your show just to hear your impression of him week to week. And that's where you're real, that's called audience affect. It's a certain emotional connection, a certain uh, recognizing a life that people have with characters and that, that I, I discussed that a bit more in my thesis and that's very academic okay now you're listening to know your rights beyond cinq 102.3 fm cable 88.3 and when we come back we're going to discuss a public domain person uh, but that'll have to wait until priscilla does her corner break talks is sponsored in part by everything out of her mouth is a test a man's guide to the emotional needs of women ladies do you want the man in your life to understand you on your level do you want your man to be able to listen to and address all of your emotional needs? Show him how much you really want your relationship to be the best it can be. Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test makes a perfect gift. The book written by a man, for men, is endorsed by every woman that reads it. This book is a guide for men to understand exactly what a woman means when she speaks. Is that worth changing your life forever? Buy this book at franktalks.com now. Loser to Seducer is the story of Frank B. Kermit. This book marks the triumph of a nice guy over most of his inner demons. This includes going from being a loser to managing five lovers at the same time, his first Valentine's Day with two women at the same time, and getting back the one that got away. Want to learn how you can change your life? Buy this book at franktalks.com. Guys, does your bachelor pad look as frightening as an Elvis convention? Then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. Do you own a twin bed and still love your Star Wars sheets? Then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. Is the only source of artificial light in your bachelor pad the bare, dusty bulb hanging from the ceiling? Then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. Do your friends walk into your apartment and think you have been robbed? 
then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. Do you think that minimalist means barren as the Gobe Desert? Then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. If your bathroom is home to a colony of anything, then you need the Pimping Your Pad Seminar. The Pimping Your Pad Seminar and telephone consultations, only available at franktalks.com. And now back to Know Your Rights on CINQ FM. Thank you very much, Priscilla Duarte. It's really nice to have you here every week as our segment producer. And you're on CINQ 102.3 FM, cable 88.3 on the internet, www.radiocentreville.com. My name is Ted Wright, coordinator of Westmont Legal Clinic. Karen Marshall is our co host, and we're with Franco and Santa Claus. Public domain character. So in a theory, anybody can use the character of Santa Claus in their works. However, you have to make sure to use your own original version of Santa Claus and not take somebody else's version of Santa Claus. Because although the character is public domain, a newer version of Santa Claus is copyrighted by the person who creates that newer version. That means that we have these movies from the 30s or 40s. They've got a Santa Claus. Then you've got, like, uh, what's that guy who... The Tim comic Allen. from Detroit, Tim Allen, the Santa Claus. He's got his own version of Santa Claus. They both have a specific copyright. Well, not necessarily Tim Allen, the company that may own that. Uh, you also have the Santa Claus and the Canadian Tire commercials, who sells uh, Canadian Tire products with Ebenezer Scrooge. So you have to remember that when you're talking about a public domain character, you're talking about the character as it was originally conceived of. A newer version of that character has its own separate copyright. A good example is the character of Frankenstein. Frankenstein, as it appeared in the original book, uh, you know the little uh, bolts that stick out of Frankenstein's neck? That was never part of the original design of Frankenstein. Those bolts were added in in the Frankenstein movies with Boris Karloff. Oh, Boris. So when you do, let's, let's say you were to do a parody of the Frankenstein character, you wanted to do a new version of the Frankenstein character. If you use those bolts, you may have to clear rights with the version of Franken, the rights holders who created the version of Frankenstein with the bolts in his neck. Okay, what if you just change the color? Let's say, like, we'll go back to Santa Claus. Let's say we turn Santa Claus suit blue. Uh, it, well, again, Nobody's going to believe you. <laughs> I would worry less about whether or not people are going to believe you. And just to answer your question, changing the color alone is not enough if it's okay. still identifiable as the character. But if you took an original picture of Santa Claus, you hired some artist to do an original picture for you and painted them blue, you don't copyright on that, pending you made sure that you had a contract with the artist saying you own those rights. If, however, you took the Tim Allen version of Santa Claus and painted it in blue, doesn't matter that you're painting in blue. There is a copyright on that Tim Allen. Song. I can't believe the show is over. you got to come back. We have barely touched the, the topic today. Well, I look forward to coming back, and uh, we'll set something up. We can talk a little bit more about entertainment law, specifically character creation and the law. Wow. that's It just, it just continues and continues. And... Uh, can you do us a favor before you go? Absolutely. I want you to say, in your Kermit voice, you're listening to Know Your Rights on CINQFM, Montreal. Hi-ho, this is Kermit the Frog, and you are listening to CINQ and Know Your Rights here in Montreal. See, now that isn't really Kermit, and you have to put it in context. Well, we can do it on this show it was under fair dealing here in Canada, but you know what? Won't be able to air that again. I know. Long. Okay, anyway, this is Know Your Rights show on CINQ 102.3 FM. My name is Ted Wright. We've got here... Karen Marshall. And there... Priscilla. And Franco, and he's going to be back uh, probably because we're going to do two or three things like this. And we've got two other people coming in, one a, one a musician and one a lawyer to talk about just this area. And we'll be back in one week. If you want to get in touch with us, it's uh, the you can fax the show, 277-8403, 277-8403. If you want to talk to the co-host, it's uh, Karen Sank FM at hotmail.com, Karen C-I-N-Q-F-M at hotmail.com. And that's it. We'll be back next week. Legal dossiers are complicated. Westmount Legal Clinic advises that you consult a lawyer. Legal cases cannot be resolved without a professional. Frank Talks is sponsored in part by Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test, a man's guide to the emotional needs of women. What would your life be like if you knew exactly what to say and do with women? This book is for the guy that simply wants to learn how to handle women's tests by addressing her emotional needs. By this... 
You create the type of attraction that will make her see you as the one she was destined to be with. This book will teach you how to get the woman you want and how to keep her. Everything out of her mouth is a test is the Rosetta Stone for men to understand exactly what a woman means when she speaks and how to respond. Is that worth changing your life forever? Buy this book at franktalks.com now.